in terms of priorities, how much would you allocate to trying to make contact with aliens and getting their help? And if we look at the next 500 beyond years, mm -hmm. and just fo uh, versus option number two, really just focusing on setting up the party on our own engineering, our, on our own, um, the, the genome, the biology of humanity, the AI mm -hmm. collaborating with humans, just the, all the engineering challenges and opportunities that we're, um, we're exploring. I'm, I'm focused in my lab, of course, a lot on the engineering of genomes, the uh, monitoring of astronauts during long missions. I, you know, reaching out to other aliens, we've been doing reach out to aliens since the first radio waves have been broadcast, so we're doing some of it, but to do a real- You made it sound like your lab is mostly focused on biology, but you also reach out occasionally to oh, aliens. <laughs> occasionally, <laughs> when they visit, they have, they bring their whiskey and I, yeah. we have a drink, but the- uh, I think we we can do. We've been broadcasting into space for you know at this point almost a century, getting close to, and you know so. But it's not been structured. So I think it's very cheap and easy to send out structured messages, um, like what Carl Sagan wrote about in Contact, doing prime numbers and sending those out to indicate intelligence. Uh, so there's things we can do that I think are very cheap and very easy. So we should we should do some of that. We can walk and chew gum at the same time. This is. One of the biggest critiques people often say of space research and, and even space flight in general is it's too expensive. Shouldn't we solve poverty? Shouldn't we uh, cure diseases? And the answer is always, as it always has been, is that you can walk and chew gum at the same time. You can you know, pass the Civil Rights Act and go to the moon in the same decade. You can improve um, and, and get rid of structural inequality while getting to uh, the moon and Mars uh, in this decade. So I think, I think we can do both. Yeah, they kind of help each other. There's sometimes criticism of like ridiculous science, mm -hmm. like studying penguins or something, or s studying yeah. the patterns of birds or fish some, and so on. Some congressman stands up and says, this is a waste of taxpayer dollars. And then, but someone says, oh, but we, and for example, CRISPR was pure research for 25 years. Now it's a household word and, and students are editing genomes in high school, but it was just pure research on weird bacteria living actually in salt, uh, hypersaline uh, lakes and rivers for decades and, and then eventually became a massive therapeutic, which has led to curing of diseases in this past year. And there's stuff that you discover as part of the research that you didn't anticipate yeah. that have nothing to do with the actual research. Like uh, oceanography uh, is one of the interesting things about that whole field is that it's a huge amount of data, neuroscience too, actually. Yeah. So you could discover computer science things like machine learning things, or even data storage manipulation, distributed compute things by having to forcing yourself to get something done about on the oceanography side. Mm -hmm. That's how you invent the internet yep. and and uh, and all those kinds of things. So to me, aliens looking for aliens out there in the universe is a motivator that just inspires inspires everybody, young people old people, scientists, artists, um, engineers, entrepreneurs, everybody. Mm -hmm. the, somehow the that line between fear and beauty, because <laughs> we're, we're- Aliens are like perfectly merged basically. Yeah. It's this- Because it's, we don't know. I mean, for you, let's start talking about primitive alien life. Are you excited by it or are you terrified? I want to make a lotion out of it. I think it'd be great if it's alien life, assuming it's safe, but I'm very excited. Uh, it doesn't have to be uh, a you lotion. You just said a half sentence, presuming it's safe. That's the <laughs> fundamental question yes, I'm trying I to get know. at. So <laughs> if you could, yes, presuming it's safe. So I think, you know, we, we have this, uh, we're, this is the beginning of some planetary protection is happening now, is we're going to send, we're bringing rocks back from Mars in 2033, if all goes according to plan. But there's always a, a danger. What if you bring this back? What if it's alive? What if it will kill all of humanity? Or Michael Creighton wrote a book, The Andromeda Strain, about this very idea. And we, it could, but it hopefully won't. And the only way you can you know, really gauge that is the same way we do with any infectious agent here on Earth, right? If it's a new pathogen, a new organism, you do it slowly, carefully. You often do it with levels of containment. So... You know, and it's going to be probably have to be where some pioneers go and would be, for example, on Mars, there might be other organisms there that only get activated once there's an ambient temperature and more humidity. And then suddenly the first settlers on Mars are encountering a strange new fungus or something that's not even like a fungus because it might be a different clade of life, a different branch of life and could be very dangerous or it could be very inert. I mean, most of life on Earth, on Earth is not really dangerous or harmful. Let me go back on this. 
most of life on Earth is neither harmful nor beneficial to you. It's just they're making its own way in the universe, just trying to survive. It's when, you know, it's inside of you and replicating your cells and destroying your cells like a virus, like like, like COVID, like SARS-CoV-2, that it becomes a big problem, of course. But it, it's, you know, just doesn't really have agency. It's just trying to get by. And so, mo- for example, most of the bacteria on the, on the table on your skin in the subway are pretty inert. They're just, um, you know, people hanging around for the ride. And actually just because we're talking so much trash about viruses, most viruses are, don't bother humans. Yeah, and they're phages. Almost all the, the vast majority of viruses are phages. There's this, this the battle in the biology that is really dorky is that bacteria think that they're the most, you know, people, people study bacteria think the bacteria are the most important because there's trillions and trillions of them. They run a lot of our own biology in our body. The, but then people who study phages, they say, well, there's 10 times more phages than the bacteria, which just can attack the bacteria and destroy them as well. So... Fage people think that they run the world, uh, but <laughs> that we need them both. Uh, what do you think about viruses? All right, so, because you, you said alien organisms, mm-hmm. wouldn't we encounter something like bacteria, something like viruses okay. as the first alien life form? Are they, first of all, are viruses alive or not? So the, the book definition, if you go pick up a biology textbook, they'd say technically no, because they don't have the ability to self-replicate independently. But I would think if you restructure how you view what life is, it's just autonomously uh, aggregating and replicating of information. Uh, for example, AI at some point, what if there's an AI platform that we could consider alive? Like at what point would you allow it to say it's alive? And, and I think we have the same definitional challenge there is that if it can c- continually propagate uh, instructions for its own existence, then it is a version of living. I think you know viruses don't get that uh, category because they can't do it on their own, but they are a version of life, I'd say, but probably not alive. Yeah. Well, they are expressing themselves and doing so on occasion quite powerfully in human civilization. So, um, like you said, at which point are AI systems allowed to say? We're life. We, we are allowed. Humans must allow them. (laughs) And the viruses didn't ask for permission (laughs) to express themselves to humans. They just kind of, they just kind of did. We didn't have to allow them. (sighs) Are they overall though exciting or terrifying to you as somebody who has studied viruses? Oh, whenever given two options, there's always two more. You could do both or neither. So here I'll say they're both uh, terrifying and exciting, I think to me. More exciting than terrifying, I think. If I had to make that sandwich, and how many layers are, you know, meat versus cheese? There's a lot more cheese of excitement. And meat, meat is meat is the fear. Is the fear in this metaphor? In, apparently, in the sandwich. <laughs>